This is the Ask Foleschini podcast, where the modern economy is discussed from a skeptic's perspective. Mr. Foleschini helps you distinguish what is sustainable in our economy and what isn't. Not everything that glitters is gold, and not all mud is dirty. The podcaster Mr. Foleschini provides no-nonsense advice. He had it all, lost it all, went bankrupt multiple times, and is now attempting to come back from zero with sustainable growth. There are numerous coaches and preachers on the internet that preach about positive thinking and how life is all roses if you just care to see it that way. Well, Mr. Foleschini is definitely not one of them. We recommend you ask Foleschini to keep it real. He discusses the darker side of the current economic reality, the side that's more important for your personal and business finance. His first intention is to help you keep what you already have. Not to be a complete party pooper, Mr. Foleschini will also hint at the earning opportunities in the economy today. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please like, share, and subscribe. And now it's time to start taking notes. The mic goes to the podcaster, the one and only Mr. Foleschini. Welcome to the Ask Foleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Charlene Norman from Toronto, Canada. Charlene is an advisor to business owners, funders, entrepreneurs, and CEOs with desire to grow, scale, and expand. She has deep affinity for those who freely admit they don't know everything. What makes her different? Besides having extensive experience in devising new ways to make a profit and believing that no two business owners are the same and neither are their empires. She believes business is fun, leadership is not difficult, and making money is easy. Her superpowers are peace of mind and empathy. Of course, deliver with innovation and inspiration. Charlene, please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, Peter. What is my story? Uh, a lot of luck, a lot of being at the right place at the right time, and paying attention. Now that I have a few years behind me, paying attention to that little voice inside of me. That's my story. It's not the typical one that you're probably most of your guests talk about. Well, I've been successful here, there and everywhere. And here's the way I did it. And here's the top five things or the ten, top 20 things you got to do. I say we're successful because of what we have in here how we follow that and how we try and maximize it to the best of our ability. Okay. Well, very nice. I read your uh, email newsletter and yes. you always touch on such a variety of different topics and always or almost always uh, is something from what happened to you and you explain how this works. Uh, the latest one that I read was about 23 years old uh, business person. And you explained uh, how uh, you were basically knowing all at 23. Uh, I was the same. So I, I, I could connect with the newsletter that you wrote. So um, uh, you, you, you sent uh, this newsletter quite often. Uh, do you have a team that helps you do that? Or uh, do you do newsletters on your own? I do not have a team. I have been writing since since I was a, a wee one. I never considered myself to be a proper writer, um, but I have been writing all my life. And I started writing to my, my clients about seven or eight years ago. And it was after I had written my first book. And I realized that it just gives me great, uh, great joy. If you ask me, do I have a theme? Sometimes I have a theme, but generally it's whatever pops into my head and or whatever it is that I'm doing. And I go, well, there's something someone should know. I try very hard not to be about me. I will just use me as an example, but I always try and give a lesson that is pretty universal that over time, honestly, as we age, we forget. Mm -hmm. When I was 20, though, I'll tell you, when I was 20, um, I had a fantasy. My fantasy was uh, I was going to win um, one of the lotto 
big lotteries. I was going to win $25 million. And what I was going to do with that was I was going to parcel out that money to all kinds of businesses who needed funding. Yeah, everybody knows they need funding. So though there was one caveat. I would give them low interest rates. I would give them easy to pay terms and everything. But um, they had to have me on their on their board. They had to have me as their advisor. And so there were two things wrong with that. Number one, I never bought lottery tickets. So I don't know how you can possibly win $25 million if you're <laughs> not buying tickets. But the second thing is, I don't think I know anybody at 20 who is in a position to advise anybody about anything. We're young, we're cocky, we're full of uh, vim and vigor. We have absolutely no fear, but we also have no wisdom, no strengths to draw upon at 20. Fast forward many decades, and I can say everything that I ever did in my career, no matter how great it looked from the outside, was always about getting the experience to be able to advise small businesses, small and medium-sized businesses. So... My point here is, whether we know it or not, and I sure didn't know it until much later, we come into this world with some ideas. They're hardwired into us. We go through the normal education process. We go through the normal business process. We buy into a lot of stuff. And eventually, most of us figure out, oh, no, no, I like this better. And this is what I'm all about. So I can say everything I've ever learned, everything I've ever done really was pushing me to fulfill my original fantasy, which was helping small and medium-sized businesses. Uh-huh. That is great. Um, that, that, I'm, I'm fascinated because uh, I was the same. Um, the younger I was, uh, the more thing I believed I, I, I knew. And uh, the, the older I get, the more I know that I know nothing. So it's uh, quite mm -hmm. frustrating in a way. However, it's also liberating because uh, you don't need to know everything. <laughs> you don't need to know everything. Um, and in fact, every single mistake we make, every single setback we have, every every single, I hate the word failure, but every single misstep or off the beaten path that we take is actually for a higher reason. It's to make us stronger. It's to make us become the person that we're supposed to be. And when it happens to us in, a, in the heat of the moment, we never think about that. Um, given that we both shared similar ideas. I can well imagine your reaction was exactly mine. Oh my God, why did this happen? I didn't deserve this. This is just garbage. I don't need this stuff. Get me out of here. This is not what I, this is normal. This is so normal. And yet we needed to fall on our behinds. We needed to be smacked across the side of the head. We needed to crash into a wall to realize there are other points of view besides our own. We do not always have the best ideas going forward. and. There are some squares and some rounds in our personality that needs rounding or squaring off. And, and it's those negative situations that ultimately become our best lessons forward. We don't get those things in school. We don't get those things uh, from a mentor um, in a workplace. We don't get those things from our parents. We do it to ourselves for good reason. Uh, I would agree 100% with you on that. And I'm also amazed that in the time when everybody is discussing intelligence, even artificial intelligence, and intelligence on steroids, or however you want to call it, you are all about wisdom. Uh, why do you believe uh, business depends more on wisdom than intelligence? At the end of the day, Business is built on people. Mm -hmm. It's people that bring the wisdom to the organization so that the organization can grow, can expand, can contribute to the world. Artificial intelligence will never do that. Robots will never do that. Computers will never do that. People, human beings, we're 
no matter how wonderful tech is, people are the secret to everything. People are the messy parts and the best parts to move forward with. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence, I, I don't think, is at the stage yet where we'd like it to be. The good part about artificial intelligence and technology, the best part about that is it can get rid of a lot of repetitive stuff. Mm -hmm. Stuff that our brain goes, oh my God, I got to do that for the hundredth time. This is really boring. And then what it does is it frees us up to do what we're good at, which is problem solve, which is being creative or innovative or critical thinking um, or thinking outside the box, dreaming up new stuff or creating beauty. That's what humans are really good at. And in the right, in the right recipe, in the right mixture, when you put humans like that into a business, the business can't help but expand and grow. You cannot get that out of robots, out of artificial intelligence. It's all humans. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. Um, you discuss uh, compassionate capitalism. Could you uh, elaborate more about this uh, compassionate uh, capitalism? What what is it all about? What what is different from the social uh, from the socialism idea? What's different from the capitalism that we live uh, today? So mm, that's a really big that's a really big question. So I'm going to take in a couple of couple of chunks. Um, we can see the good and the bad that the old-fashioned capitalism that we've had for hundreds and hundreds of years, we can see the effect. Um, uh, everything's about power. Everything's about wealth. It's a, That's where the priorities are. And we can see that the world is, the, the, the globe is at um, 35% of what it was even 60 years ago. We have basically raped and pillaged the earth. We've raped and pillaged people um, all for more wealth in the hands of a few, all for power. Um, I spent a good 40 years working inside of that system and rebelling against that system. And I discovered because nobody knows this going in, but I discovered there were ways to make money. There were ways to get ahead of the competition. There were ways to grab more market share that didn't involve power struggles, that did not involve raping and pillaging. What I discovered was when you put people first, which is a completely foreign and different concept, things started to change. Then when I added in, well, wait a minute, that's for the people side. Now, what about for the planet side or what about the community side? All of a sudden things took off. So one day I sat down and I thought, what is it that I can share with the world um, that's maybe a little bit different um, than what other people have done? And I thought, well, I actually have hands-on experience doing a gentler form of capitalism. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? Well, I always operated with compassion. So I said, okay, let's put the two things together. It didn't exist. I originally heard about compassionate prosperity, but that was that took me into a wrong spot. So I went to compassionate capitalism. What that means is it puts a human face on business. It puts protecting the globe pretty close to the top of all priorities. Second is people, third is profits. It means paying the costs socially for whatever you pull out of the earth. So, so for example, we all love to use the airplanes. We all love to travel right, left, and center. Well, we also know that taking those trips damages the earth. So it makes sense to me when I look at it and say, okay, buried in the cost of doing business is the cost of of, of fixing or cleaning up whatever we disturbed. Mm -hmm. Not all businesses are going to fall into that bucket where they rape and pillage. But all businesses do, in my opinion, do have an obligation 
to treat whatever we have left of this planet as precious. And I say precious because we all need land. We all need air. We're losing both at an, at an alarming rate. We're losing vegetation. We're losing animals. We're, we're losing things that we've depended on our entire lives, haven't thought about, and looking around and saying, well, we were given utopia, and, man, it's kind of screwed it up. we got to stop. So exploring compassionate capitalism, I prefer the term exploring because I don't have all the answers. Um, what I do is I pull in people who have different, nobody has all the answers. So I pull in people who have different aspects, and I just try and simplify and synthesize what everyone's talking about and say, well, gee, you know, if we did this, we could do this. If we did this, we could do this. And in my experience, when you put the purpose, solving the planet, some part of the planet is always a good one. Um, and you put your people first, your profits naturally come along. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just you, a nicer way of doing business. Would you agree that all these power uh, struggles and power distribution is basically uh, based on arbitrage instead of adding value. So uh, when I say arbitrage, I I, I say like uh, people getting money from the bank in order to buy buy to rent property. So the arbitrage is between the rent and the uh, the cost of money they pay to the bank instead of them creating something new that would uh, add value that everyone would enjoy and the people would then be prepared to pay for this value. The short answer is yes. Okay. Um, arbitrage is not a word in my vocabulary because I don't come from the investing world. Mm -hmm. um, but but what I will say is um, we all have a North Star. In very simple terms, the North Star can be all about me. The North Star can be all about you. Or the North Star can be all of us. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at what you're calling arbitrage, I say there's been far, far too much emphasis on all about me. I have the money, I have the power, so I'm going to do. And Elon Musk today is the perfect example of that. But it's all about me. And I win at the expense of someone else losing. And so I, I believe. Those two things feed into the arbitrage uh, mm -hmm. concept that you're bringing up. Those two things are not about value add. They're about value take at the expense of someone else. Now, it's a zero sum game. So. It's a totally zero sum game. It's not it's it's not healthy. It's 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 why we're where we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in the time that all mainstream business gurus preach about grinding, suffering, giving up things, giving up private life, and all the nice things in life to be successful, you believe business is fun, leadership is not difficult, and making money is easy. Can you please elaborate on this? I'm such a huge fan of your concepts. <laughs> so it goes back to what is the purpose of what is the main purpose of our uh, of our existence as humans? Our main purpose of our, of our existence is to have fun, happiness, joy, connectedness, family. That's mainly what life is about for us. We go to school and we learn, oh my God, you're going to have become this kind of a person with this kind of an education, which means you're going to become this kind of a business. Choose whatever profession you want to be. And now... You're going to be a cutthroat person to get to the top. Being cutthroat goes completely contrary to the way we were designed. But we fall into that and fell into that easily because, well, it's all about me and, and, and it's a zero-sum game and I'm going to win against you and blah, blah, blah. So when I was, I don't know, 26, somewhere in there, my first manager's job, I was pretty full of myself because I had great examples of leaders who showed me what cutthroat meant, showed me what being a leader was about, which was always stomping and stepping on other people. So I did that. I did everything. 
I was amazing in my first three months. We accomplished so much all because of me. Well, at three months, my team of six, who all made more money than me, by the way, um, they called me in one night. They said, Char, we think you're a great person, but as a manager, you really suck. And if you don't change their ways, we're going to quit. So, okay, I listened to them. Um, I tried to get my face blank. What I realized was they were calling me on the carpet for all the behaviors that I had copied that I had seen that didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. And they were, and they just wanted me to change to be a natural person, as in respect them, as in allow them say into things, as in don't demand um, my stuff on their schedule to organize. Can we do this? And everything that they wanted me to change was doable. It was like so doable, it wasn't even funny. And I realized later, I had been sold a big bill of goods from everyone who had gone before me saying, this is the way. So I changed myself and I said, no, we're going to have fun. We're going to have joy. There are going to be times when it's not so great. And yes, there's going to be times when we're fearful, but we're stronger together. So I didn't, I didn't have to have all the right answers anymore. I could rely on uh, the other people. Now, here's the thing. When you rely on other people, and I mean that deliberately, you don't second guess them. You don't speak to them nicely and do something else behind their back. You invite them to the table and you respectfully ask their opinion. You joke around. Um, you get very focused on what you're doing. All of a sudden, what I did was here and my people took it up to here. And um, what I realized was when you involve people authentically, all of a sudden everything is fun. Nothing is difficult. There are no turf wars. There are no miserable fights, no misconceptions. No, it's it's fun. It's joyful. Now here's the other thing. We're all taught, well, you got to do this because this is important in your career. Well, maybe, but it may not fit with you personally. Mm -hmm. You may be absolutely one of these rocks, rock star people who looks at a bunch of numbers and says, oh, my God, that means this. I look at a bunch of numbers and I go, oh, my God, I don't know what that means. And there's nothing wrong with either one of us. It's a case of just acknowledging, OK, that is not my strength and leaning on someone else who has that strength, recognizing that we all have limitations I'm really good at this, so I can keep doing that. And I don't have to do all this because all these other people are way better at it than I am. When you get to that stage, all of a sudden, the frustration, the pain, the awful negative feelings that you have, they go away. They go to the bottom. And now it's all about, well, how much more fun can we have? And I don't mean fun as in, you know, it's a laugh a minute. It's, I mean, it's, it's enjoyable. It's happy. You don't you don't go in with a headache and leave with a headache, mm -hmm. which so many people do these days. Uh, would you say that this is the the, the managers? Uh, we all had a problem in the beginning uh, as a director of an art gallery, uh, because the director of an art gallery uh, wants to be the most important person in the building. However, when the uh, painters like Picasso enter. You're just not the most important person in the, the building. You're just enabling them to present themselves and you are there to serve them. Would, would you agree with, uh, with that comparison? I have a saying that I've used forever and a day. Rank has no privilege. So just because I'm the big guy, just because I make all this money does not mean that my opinions are better than anyone else's. Everyone has an opinion. Some opinions may be a bit more informed for certain things. In your case, the director of the art gallery, he, like all good leaders, is at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's the customer, it's the end user who is at the top. We serve at the convenience of the person who's buying our stuff. And 
in the case of the artist coming in, where does the artist fit? Well, if the artist is the one with the vision, if the artist is the one who's producing these amazing things, then that artist sits equal to the art director. Okay. I really like your concept of uh, bulletproof your business. Uh, and um, I really like it because I'm technical. I always think about bulletproofing as uh, something technical or, um, you know, getting more knowledge or uh, building higher wall or, uh, you know, using dancer material or something like that. But uh, if I understand correctly, you're all about intangibles. So the more you take care of the intangible part of the business, the more bulletproof your business becomes. Is that correct? That is absolutely 100% correct. So um, how did you manage to get from all this? You explained what was, uh, would you be comfortable sharing the industry you were working with uh, when, uh, um, in, in that case, when you, where you explained that you, you led a six team, a six people team? Most of my um, early years uh, were in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing is a really nasty, horrible area. Um, it's a little bit cleaner now. In those days, the robots had not taken over. In those days, uh, there was no thought given to raping and pillaging the earth. We just did it. Mm -hmm. As time went on, I went from manufacturing to manufacturing and uh, uh, sales and service. So that's that's why I can speak the way I speak. Uh, would you say that um, that there is more more um, in, in sales and service? There's much more. Um, I say um, feeling about people, how they feel, and all this stuff because they have to perform on a different level. Or, or uh, is that also going into manufacturing now? No, um, no. I, I I actually don't see much difference. Uh, people are people. So you got the real jerk faces who are all about me, 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 powers me, powers me. And that spans all industries. You also have the people who I will serve that spans all industries. And you also have the people that say, okay, we're all in this together. It spans all industries. Um, a perfect example is uh, the tech. Everyone thinks that the tech thing is just amazing, right? Well, how many tech companies have we read about in the papers over the last couple of months? They're doing exactly what manufacturing did a long time ago. They're laying off between 10 and 15, 25% of their staff. Why? Well, because we're just not making enough money. Well, that's the wrong priority. Yes, we all want to make money. I think making money is absolutely freaking amazing. And I can share all kinds of things on different ways to make money. But laying off your staff points to really bad management decisions in the first place, as in, why the hell did you hire so many without a full thought? You're getting rid of because you're getting rid of them because you grew too quickly. You didn't grow too quickly. You were dreaming too fast. And that now becomes a, okay, are we thinking the right way for the future? So when when people are saying, well, the tech industry is losing and it's and it's and it's no longer the one the wonder kid, I say it never was the wonder kid because not enough people who were actually doing the work, doing the leading, were thinking in terms of what are we doing to contribute to the world. They were thinking in terms of the bottom line, which is always profit driven and wealthy for the few. Oh. Would you use uh, would you use uh, sustainability as a buzzword for uh, what went wrong? Um, you know the, the problem with sustainability is is I, I think it's overused. I think it started out somewhere in the green movement. Then it became this thing about well we've got to be sustained and sustaining our operations. And and now I really don't know what sustainability means anymore. Um, in many cases, my observation of the tech world, it took a lot of human designed, human thought processes and ratcheted them up maybe 10, 100 times, 100 fold. So a lot of cases, there were tech companies that were lending money 
no different. Well, their business model was actually no different than a whole pile of other business models that came before them. They were just playing in the tech space. Well, okay, to me, that's a little bit incestuous, but okay, just have to look. Did others go down? Yeah, well, it's your turn now. Um, in, in the case of social media, to me, social media arena is no different than the restaurant business. There's one on every corner and everybody knows that you can get into the restaurant business. It's kind of tough. The margins actually aren't quite as good as you thought. And there's a lot of work to be done. No one's really figured out a good model for restaurants. And if you take social media, I don't think anyone's figured out a good model for social media either. So they fall back on the old things of we'll just lay off all these people because, well, it's because you didn't make the right decisions in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners from... Um... What 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 should our listeners take from this interview? What what is the the most important thing that they should remember? Are there any quick tips or trade secrets that you can share with our listeners? Trade secrets. Every one of us, every single one of us, is born. We have it in our DNA of what we what our best traits are, what our best skills and talents are that we can use. It's already in us. The point of going through your career is to find out what those are and then do more of it or use more of it and use more of it in pursuit of what's in the highest good for all of us. Remembering you will never make a decision that's going to satisfy everyone because mm -hmm. nobody is going to win. There's no losers on this. There's no outright winners. But together, when you use your God-given, spirit-given, universe-given talents and skills that are in here, that I call your North Star, to the best of your ability, that is when you can move forward in your career, in your business, and in whatever impact it is that you want to make on the world. Oh, thank you. Um, how can our listeners uh, reach you? What is the uh, best way to, to follow your newsletter? How can they get in touch with you? And yeah. Best place to get a hold of me is on LinkedIn because I play there every day. Um, you can go to my website, uh, www.bulletproofyourbusinessnow.com. That's a mouthful. Um, I'll include links in, in, in the description. Thank you. <laughs> And you can sign up for my newsletter there. Uh, I do not sell. As you know, on my Sunday opinion pieces, I don't sell anything. I just share, okay, well, here's a thought. Here's a thought. And, and, and here's a lesson. And, and that's that's how I try and inspire the world. Yeah, but uh, if someone would uh, decide, they can also hire you, if I understand correctly, to, to improve their business. Find me on LinkedIn. I respond to all, I respond to everything. If you want to talk to me more about finding your own North Star, I can help you with that. If you want to talk to me about growing your business, I can help you with that. Uh, DM me through LinkedIn is probably the fastest way to get a hold of me. Okay. Thank you, Charlene, for uh, being my guest tonight. It's been a pleasure, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Faleschini, for this outstanding podcast. And thank you for listening to the Ask Faleschini podcast until the end. Mr. Faleschini would love to hear your feedback in the comments. And don't forget, if you want to know, ask Faleschini or listen to the Ask Faleschini podcast. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.